This is the Hacking Real Estate Podcast, Episode 7. I went with the suburb of Savannah for um, a couple reasons. So one, they have large multinational employers. And so that's something that I found out on Google Maps. I just literally was looking for like national labs, hospitals, military bases, but some of that's personal knowledge as well. And I, and I, that's advice I now give to people in real estate or try looking to get into it is that, you know, if, if you have any distinct knowledge on a market that uh, might allow you to invest more competently than someone who's not from that place, consider it. Welcome to the Hacking Real Estate Podcast, where we dive into the stories of seasoned, hands-on, and tech-savvy real estate investors. We'll learn the strategies and tools they use to maximize returns and minimize hassle, all while navigating the rapidly changing real estate market. I'm your co-host, Brandon Hall, and managing partner of Hall CPA, and I'm sitting alongside my co-host, Vikas Gupta, CEO of Azebo. With our combined 15 years of experience in real estate investing and entrepreneurship, we're here to help you up your real estate game. Let's get hacking. Today's guest is Zane Harris. Zane is a longtime tech product person, previously at Wayfair, currently at Shopify. He is also a tech founder and is a real estate investor himself with a fantastic setup for self-managing his business. Zane, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Zane, in your own words, can you tell us a little bit about your real estate story? Yeah, totally. Um, so I've been interested in real estate for a long time, but for me, where it really started, um, I had left the Southeast where I'm from, from Atlanta, was living out in San Francisco and had a really good friend also working in product. Um, and this guy before the age of 30 had amassed like over 25 properties, I think. Um, and I just found myself really looking at what he had built and saying to myself, you know, he works a product job all day long, just like I do. We were doing virtually identical work. And, um, I was like, how do he figure it out? Like if he figured it out and he can do it, I'm going to make him teach me. This is my, my best friend. And, um, so that's kind of where it got started in terms of just interest. And I really began just asking questions every time one would come up and, um, where things where I saw a real unlock was during COVID. Um, like a lot of people, I was stuck at home, had tons of free time. Um, and used it to do research. I'm just a really research oriented guy. And I like to kind of absorb all the details before I jump into something, especially if there's any risk. Um, so I used all that time at home. I mean, every podcast you've probably heard of, uh, forums, asking my friend more questions, also like going in, out into my network, figuring out what people were doing, what was working, um, et cetera. Um, and just getting a feel for the reporting and analytics you could do in the real estate space and like what information was out there. Um, so I use, that's really how I use the time. And then finally took the leap about a year into the pandemic is when I took the leap and got my first property. Got it. Super cool story. One that's certainly not uncommon to, to the way we hear about things to help the audience sort of put it in context. What does your current portfolio look like? Um, so today I have four homes. Um, one is a condo in Midtown Atlanta, uh, which I really taught me a lot. <laughs> um, the other three are very different. Um, they're single family homes and they're in the suburbs of Savannah. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've done a lot in Georgia, uh, just being from there. Um, I could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I also want to know, like, like I want to dive into the, uh, it taught me a lot comment you just made. So the, the condo, what did it teach you? What, what mistakes did you make as you were picking that up and trying to rent it out? Yeah, I mean, it just, that property is so different from the other ones. And I really fail, fell victim to, number one, buying something that I liked, uh, not that my ultimate target market liked. Um, and I'm still, to this day, glad to have it if I ever move back home. There's a great property there that I'm in love with. But, you know, that was number one. Um, number two, I made a lot of assumptions about um, the lack of effort that would be involved if there was something like an HOA taking care of things. Um, in reality, it's kind of the opposite. Dealing with an HOA is such a pain. Um, having neighboring walls, neighboring units creates too many problems. Um, so for a variety of reasons, um, I, I, I wouldn't say it was necessarily my ideal investment, but it taught me a lot. Um, it, for instance, the type of tenants that you get when you're um, renting out a condo in the middle of an urban area, a lot of young professionals. Um, typically, I'm renting either people in the entertainment industry or in the tech industry because this is Atlanta and that's who lives in Midtown. And uh, while I like what they are willing to pay for the property, they turn over once a year a lot of times. That's like just the life of a young professional. Um, and so that means that you have a higher vacancy rate. And so I learned just from that. Uh, they also are 
a lot like me in terms of the profile. Uh, they're demanding renters. They want a lot for their money. If something's not perfect, like they're going to say something. Um, and, you know, that just comes with certain responsibilities when you're managing the properties. And, and for me, um, I can explain this more when it comes to the single family homes, but in general, um, I want to be managing the properties. Um, so I'm not looking to do investments that hand over the property to a property manager, primarily because I want to uh, preserve my margin. Um, and when I went about investing, that was very front of mind. So figuring out a path to do that was really important to me. I know other people take a different approach, but for me, that was very important. Interesting. So before we jump into the property management piece, I want to explore the HOA complexities. You know, I, I guess you could ask, how did that make your life easier or harder? But in most cases, HOAs make your life harder. So how how did having the HOA make your life harder as you were trying to rent this property out? Yeah, um, I, yeah, I can talk to that. So this property is super unique. Um, it actually used to uh, belong to the actor who's passed. His name's Paul Walker. Um, and I, it's, it's unique in that it has a private entrance, a pri like private elevator, private parking space. Um, really, really great for renting out to the entertainment industry, especially actors. They, they love to be able to come and go, not be seen. It's, it's killer. Um, but what that also means, having a private entrance, it's, it's on the first floor. It's uh, one of only three condos on the first floor of a 30-story building. And it has its own plumbing infrastructure versus the rest of the building, which has created so many problems. Um, the, uh, basically, when there's a plumbing issue, it affects all three of the units. Um, there's different underlying uh, piping. And along the way, as there have been issues that are really up to the building to solve to create long term solutions for, it's just been kind of like pulling teeth. You know, me personally, when there's a single family home, if I need to make an investment to get something fixed and have a long lasting solution, I'm willing to do it and I'm going to do it right the first time. Uh, but an HOA, for various uh, reasons, they're incentivized sometimes not to, whether that's managing the reserve or what have you. Maybe the, the person managing things on the property just isn't that tuned in. Um, there's a variety of reasons why it just is a little harder to get things done. Um, and one other example, um, when you have neighboring units, other people's idiocy can lead to issues. Um, so I had a neighbor upstairs who wanted to redo their floors and poured concrete. Um, and when they did that, the, the contractor that poured concrete uh, did it incorrectly and it leaked through the ceiling, through a fire alarm and onto my floor. and chasing down their insurance, that neighbor, just very manual stuff that you just don't deal with when you have a yard surrounding your property and like people further away and just these kind of headaches that are very unique to condos. Do you find that the HOA is more or less or the same sort of receptive given that you lease the unit as opposed to you living in it yourself? Like, are they biased towards residents, owner residents? This particular building, no. Um, so it's one of the only condo buildings in Midtown Atlanta that allows rentals at all. That's really been, if it's a, it, you're either a building of rentals or you're building condos in Atlanta, uh, more or less. Um, and that, that is also what attracted me to this, uh, this building. And, um, and there are some pros to that, but I would say this building, it's fine. Um, I could see a situation where I could see that happening, but for me, it hasn't really been a problem. So you got the condo, you learned some lessons, and then you moved into... SFR. Tell, tell us a little bit how you, you made your first SFR purchase and what does that look like? Yeah. So pr pretty much after that process, just looking at, you know, um, the success of it, cause there are some really good things I can speak to about the condo, like you know, the margin there and the return is, is much greater. And I can talk about how I've been able to do that with the condo, but I took a step back and I basically, um, for anyone working in technology, especially product, this will be relatable. I took a step back and said, what if I took the approach that I take at work to making my next decision on investment here? And so that's what I did. I like, I sat down, I, define my target market. I said, who are these people? What's their persona? What do they care about? Where do they want to live? What will they pay? All of it. Um, like traditional, just user research, old school. Um, and so as I was trying to define, you know, how can I get rid of all the things that I don't like about this condo? Um, you know, some of what I just talked about uh, dealing with an HOA that got marked off. I said, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, but other things I said to myself, what is a target market that isn't going to turn over frequently? Um, and so today, for instance, I target uh, pretty young families. Uh, typically, they'll have a child um, and a 3-2 or a 3-3 really meets their needs. Um, they care a lot about school districts. It's like very, very important to them, and they're willing to pay more for it, which I found out while doing some research, um, just asking friends and family to kind of fit in this segment. Um, they really care about the school districts. Um, other things like crime rating is important to them. Access to a highway and like commute routes is another one. So I'm, I'm targeting that group because they turn over 
over very frequently, but also many of them, it's these are their own words, they're three or four years from buying their own home. So I find that they treat the properties very well. They keep them clean. They, they want it to appear as if it is their home. They're probably not mentioning that they're renting to some friends and family, you know? So that's very ideal for me. Um, and so I'm targeting those people, but then when it comes to the actual property, there were also some things that um, I do a little bit differently. So um, the, the age of the condo and, um, and things like that definitely taught me that you want the internals to not have a lot of issues if you want to keep your OPEX low. Um, and so whenever I'm looking at purchasing a home, one of the things I'm betting is the age of, I have a, a spreadsheet of all the internals that could be in a home and the average lifespan from some research I've done. And then the actual age of it, whenever I'm looking at a home, I calculate the difference and I try to uh, basically forecast what my operating expense might end up being for that home based on the age of all the internals. And I'm looking for very low OPEX, homes typically built after like 1985, stuff that just um, reliable builds, uh, reliable materials, um, I just don't want to see a lot of things breaking down because that combo of tenants who don't turn over and often don't complain with homes that don't break down equals no work for me. <laughs> so, and that's what, that's what we're shooting for. So that was really, that's what the process looked like is like, how can I minimize all the effort that I'm putting into this one property and not have to go through those things again and, and try to really make sure I was paying attention to what the, uh, the people who would be moving in would, would want and ultimately what they pay for. Got it. That's super interesting. Uh, that that level of detail and that sort of rigor. I guess you're right. That's exactly what I would expect out of one of my product leads. Um, so how are you getting this information, right? Because it's not necessarily something that shows up on a listing. It's not something necessarily that like most agents, unless you have a special one, is going to work with. It doesn't always show up on the expect inspection. How are you getting the information you need to do your diligence? Yeah, there are things like you can get a good school rating is like uh, one thing online. You can find good school ratings and t typically like I'll map on Google map um, a given area. So even before that step, I've kind of gotten to um, uh, investing in an area with really good underlying economic fundamentals. And so I went with the suburb of Savannah for um, a couple reasons. So one, they have large multinational employers. And so that's something that I found out on Google Maps. So I just literally was looking for like national labs, hospitals, military bases, but some of that's personal knowledge as well. And I, and I, that's advice I now give to people in real estate or trying looking to get into it is that, you know, if, if you have any distinct knowledge on a market that uh, might allow you to invest more competently than someone who's not from that place, consider it, consider using that to your advantage. And so for me, I knew Savannah and Atlanta very well. Um, and I thought to myself, okay, well, what, uh, what do I know about Savannah? Uh, mapped out a lot, a lot of the large multinational employers. Uh, also, I knew the commuting routes into the city. And there was this phenomenon that I knew about, which is um, unique to Savannah. There is a large art school there called SCAD. Um, it attracts international students. Um, and it has made living in in-town Savannah extremely expensive. They've all pushed the rent prices up. So what's happened is these young families, are they've all had to move out to the suburbs, but most of them want to be kind of close to the city. And so this first section of suburbs that you hit when you leave Savannah is really where a lot of them are going. Um, and so for that reason, I started looking there. I said, okay, there's a lot of population movement to this area. There are some good schools. You can quickly get to these uh, large multinational employers. Um, overlaid that with like crime ratings uh, for various areas. Um, which the, I can't remember exactly where I got that, but there's heat maps and things like that all over the internet. Um, looked at like, um, also this is kind of like, you really have to do this manually, but I would look and see like, how far are they from things like a major um, uh, store, like a Walmart and just like the things that people in suburbs need to get to like frequently, um, just to kind of do a gut check on like, would I want to live that far from these things that are going to help me get my day-to-day -day done? Um, so again, just putting yourselves in the seat of your, end user and thinking like what's going to make this more appealing but ultimately the schools matter more than everything i like that is what matters more than everything and that's why it helps to target people with with children and thinking backwards into that three two um so a lot of google map is the answer is the answer and also for the underlying economic fundamentals a lot of that's publicly available government data you can get it on a lot of government websites um trended i try to get back uh, trends looking back as far as I can find, but typically a couple decades is not unreasonable to find. And you can kind of see movement to certain areas. You can also see like how the incomes are growing, uh, the education levels, things like that. So I just look for general healthy trends of all the things that you would want, like people becoming educated and like moving to an area. If you own rental units, but don't want to pay for expensive software, check out Azebo, the smarter way to manage your rental properties. With Azebo, you can automate rent collection, find quality renters, simplify accounting and tax prep, 
Get a bank account designed for real estate investors and save on rental property insurance. All of these services are free through Azebo. Join thousands of real estate investors who trust Azebo to manage their rental business in one convenient platform. Sign up today at azebo.com slash HRE. That's A-Z-I-B-O dot com slash H-R-E. So can you actually expand on the school district school district piece? Because I've, I've heard this before too elsewhere that if you can pick up uh, three twos in really strong school districts, your, your vacancy is essentially nothing. Um, and, and you can charge great prices because families want to be there. You know, you, you have working knowledge of Savannah, so maybe, maybe that's your competitive advantage, right? You just know. But if you were going into a new market, how would you identify where the strong school districts are? So greatschools.org is a really, really helpful website, but you are correct that the uh, knowing the market itself and in particular, the network that you've got there, the team that you've got there, everyone I work with, the, the maintenance person that I work with, um, the person who cleans in between uh, tenants and does various other tasks around the house, they're actually husband and wife. Uh, my real estate agent who referred me to them, I was referred to my real estate agent. All of this is like through my network. And if you are from somewhere or have spent a lot of time somewhere for me, I spent summers in college in Savannah. So that's how I knew the market um, or knew people there. Um, it helps you build that team out. And then if you need to bridge a gap in your knowledge, like say that, you know, you're looking at greatschools.org and like you are you think a school is good, but you're not totally sure based on what you see, you can run that by the agent and say, hey, like, what do you know about the school? What are your, you know, people that are buying from you saying, like, what are you seeing? Because agents are seeing that too. Like they, they're hearing people consider that when they do a walkthrough of the home, they're hearing it as a request when people are looking to buy. So I leverage, you know, the people who um, I'm working with on the real estate side to buy. I did just pull up greatschools.org and it actually looks really sweet. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew I knew about that one because I was um, I used to work on an app and a website called rent.com and we used to look at data overlays that can make renting easier and things like can think about what people would consider when looking to rent. And so some of this I think is also kind of coming natively to me because I've had to think through like the rental process before as a product person um, and I'm just doing it now for like the buying of homes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just be spending the rest of this podcast on Zillow. So see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Zane, I know what we've talked in the past, you've, you've talked about um, how important it is to get the right tenant and how much that makes your life easier. You've shared a lot about your sort of ideal customer profile, your ICP, if you will. What, what if anything, do you do sort of in the pre-screening and screening phase to make sure that you're getting someone who fits your parameters? You know, here's the great thing about buying something in a good school district. The number of applications I get in the first day for these homes, hundreds, hundreds. Um, and granted, I'm doing a lot of like price optimization up front. Um, there's like multiple sources online to find out what a good rental price is. Um, and I've even done tricks before. I don't know um, if anybody's ever tried this. It's very similar to a product technique. Um, but I have literally listed a fake property with fake photos in a neighborhood that I'm thinking of buying with a fake price just to see if I get hit up for, uh, for, for rent and if people that are applying can afford it. In other words, like, do, you know, uh, are these, are these people that I would like to rent to? Um, uh, so that's, you can do a lot to figure out what the right rent is, but once you kind of land on it, if you're in a good school district and you've got a reasonable price, you get so many applications that I find I can be a little strict. And so what I mean is like my, uh, promotional listing, it, it will say right up front, like you need you know, two and a half times rent, you need this credit score or higher, you must apply and pay the fee before you'll even be considered. Now, a lot of people would say, hey, that's going to push too many people away. People aren't going to apply. But here's the thing. If a potential tenant isn't willing to pay 30 bucks to apply, it's probably not my tenant. Like for, for me, that's the thing is I don't, I don't want a tenant who worries about $30. Like that, it's, it's all part of the strategy. So like, it, and it also just helps weed a bunch of people out. And, um, and I just really like that. So for me, it's just the, the absolute volume of applications that I get. I can just be a little more strict and I do put just strict credit and strict income requirements. And then even the types of income that can be um, submitted, like I really only take salaried income. So um, yeah, I'm like very strict on it. And that helps me narrow down to, I think people that are um, good in that sense. But you're an entrepreneur. Come on, man. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the irony. The irony. Um, Brandon, you're going to love this. But uh, Zane 
Tell us a little bit about your your financial setup and your automation and just how you streamline everything to make your life as easy as possible. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, from a platform perspective, I do um, from the point of promotion all the way to the rent being paid. So like promoting a property, having people apply and pay to apply, checking their credit and their income being submitted, the lease being generated, signed, and then also setting up their deposit and then their monthly recurring pay. It's all through Zillow. So I just do that because honestly, simplicity. Um, and I don't think it matters um, a lot of times that it has to be Zillow. I just say go towards the platform that can help you consolidate as many of those pieces as possible. Um, and so that's one, one really big one. Um, and then another thing that I do that uh, I've heard other people in real estate do is every single property has um, a debit card associated and a, a bank account associated with it. And that just honestly makes my accounting easier. Um, and uh, that, that's pretty straightforward. It helps me manage really my expenses coming in and out because I don't use those cards for any anything else but to pay people who work on the property. Um, and so I really love that because I can just always look just at the basic account statement and see money in and out. Super easy. Um, it's also just makes it easy when exporting to sheets, handing it over to my CPA. It's like two or three clicks and my taxes are like done for the year. So I, I think that's wonderful um, and would recommend that, um, to, that that people think about like how can I make this as clean as possible from an accounting standpoint up front, save you a lot of headache. Um, also a lesson I learned from the condo. Um, so um, so anyways, um, and as far as just um, all of the other tasks that have to get done when dealing with a rental property, I use a lot of the um, the tools and tricks of the trade that you would use in um, in R and D or in tech and stuff stuff people are familiar with like um, with uh, cleaners and uh, maintenance people I set up Google Docs and links to private YouTube videos and so if they need to know how to get into a property where the cameras on the property are the dig anything about the digital locks. Um, really just anything. I've probably set up an instructional video to show them how to get there. And I've also probably created a Google Doc and it's got a link to it within it just with very detailed instructions. For things like cleaning, um, I have a really easy to replicate cleaning process that has um, basically the cleaners go through, um, they look at uh, a set of pictures for what the rooms should look like after. Um, and I have them basically take all the exact same pictures from the same angle when they're done, send them to me. I've just vet that and make sure everything's good. Cleaning is done. Just again, great set of instructions. If you do it right the first time, you don't have to do it over and over again. And when somebody says, you know, what do you need done? Like, uh, what do you need clean? Say you have to change cleaning people for some reason. It's as simple as sending out a doc. So I just really, really try to uh, put the upfront effort in the instructions. Um, I find just has made my life a lot easier. I, I like that a lot. Um, I think that a lot of investors aspire to do that. They're probably listening to this going, I can do that. And then uh, maybe like 1% actually does it. Um, but as a, as a CPA, as an accountant, um, I, I really like the separate bank account, separate uh, debit card, credit card that you have going on per property. And I think that sometimes people think that can get pretty gnarly at scale. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, the simplicity that it provides you on the accounting side is really incredible. I mean, you can, if you can be disciplined enough to use the correct credit or debit card um, on an ongoing basis, then you don't really have to do accounting. If you're self-managing and you don't have partners, um, you know, like I, I do this too, right? So my, my rentals, I self-manage and I do the accounting at the end of the year. Uh, you know, I'll run, I'll do a bank export. I'll run a pivot table, income in equals revenue, income or expenses out equals different categories. And then my taxes are done. Um, so when you don't have partners and you can self-manage like that, it works great. And, and when you can segment those properties off into separate accounts, it's super, super simple, it saves you money on the, on the accounting side. Like you don't have to pay an outsourced accountant or bookkeeper or something to come in and clean it all up for you because you just set it up from the beginning. Um, I, I think that where we've seen that break down is around like the eight to 10 property mark. It starts to get pretty complex. So I'd be curious to know, like, like, do you, do you plan on trying to maintain that sort of structure, um, as you continue to go or. Have you thought about what happens when you hit eight, 10, 15 properties? Does that structure start to break down? I actually think it's really likely that I'll move to some kind of dedicated software to manage both the financial side and the like promotion and leasing and all the other side. I'd love to get something that's like end to end. 
I think for me, that's going to happen. Uh, my investing is on pause right now for about probably three years. I'm waiting for equity uh, to grow in these properties and I want to stack them. I might buy one property in between now and then, but my plan right now is to try and move from the four to about seven or eight in a three year period. And so when I make that move, one of the things that I've already anticipated just investing time in is like, improving my stack basically like the tools that i'm using and uh, making sure that i'm optimizing to the greatest extent possible i think for anything under about five properties you're fine um like the view that i get in chase of all my cards side by side it's just i mean it's so clean and so easy to move among them but i could see if you're getting up to that range of like eight or more it's probably a lot so yeah i'll make a change zane i got a product for you <laughs> <laughs> solves exactly that problem Great. Starts with A and rhymes with Zebo. There you go. It wasn't me who said it. <laughs> Zane, can you um, talk a little bit more about uh, sort of how you're viewing the current market environment? I mean, you hinted that you're taking a pause for a few years, and obviously things have changed quite a bit in the last 12 to 18 months. So any, any insight there? Yeah, you know, if I was going with the approach that I went with with that first condo, which is a lot more hands on, I get a lot more headaches with that. Um, but there's a reason that I haven't sold it. Um, like my post tax IRR is like 36 percent. It's insane. compared to the single family homes. It's a joke. Like it's really so much better. But that is because like it's a luxury furnished middle of an urban area unit and it's a very particular market that's willing to pay more for a furnished unit when they move to a city and 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 like i said it comes with some headaches i would probably still be investing in things like that because the return the margin is there um, but when i think about single family homes one of the things that makes me pause there is just that i know that my equity will grow in the properties and uh you know over time and so i believe that there will still be an opportunity for me to stack homes when rates are lower. Um, right now, I just wouldn't want to do it because it would hit my margins, which are already thinner. You know, there is somewhere more like 11 to 15 or maybe 16 percent on like the really good end. Um, and I just, you know, I just don't see taking a hit on those margins, like a significant hit right now because of the rates as worth it because I can put my money other places that gets me a better return. So, and, and this is also having the properties that I have when I think about my entire portfolio of investments. Right now, the portfolio is pretty balanced. So I'm not really looking to add more on the real estate side immediately. There are some other avenues for me personally that I can put my money into. Um, but when that's no longer true and uh, rates come down and those two should coincide and hopefully three or four years, let's all cross our fingers, um, that maybe sooner. Um, but when those things coincide, that's when I'll probably pick things back up. So I think it has, a, a, in summary, like a lot to do with what you're investing in and like what your returns look like and how much work you're willing to take on um, to get those returns. So somebody who's willing to be a lot more manual uh, may have a totally different uh, view on this market than I do. How often do you visit your properties? And did you buy them sight unseen or did you buy them in person? I have only seen the condo in person. Um, and that was literally so that I could furnish it. Um, at the time, I was working in product at Wayfair. Um, so I got a fantastic deal on furniture at cost, pretty much. Um, so furnishing it, um, you know, was really fun, actually. Um, and, and I did that myself and just had a good time with it. Um, so that's really the only one I've seen. Um, lived in it for a few months. Um, and at the time I was traveling a lot, Airbnb it for a couple months after that before finally renting it out full, full time. Um, the other ones, yeah, I've never seen them. Um, and, I mean, unless you can't like FaceTime, uh, but, uh, but really that network that I was talking about comes into play huge because when a property has needed like uh, digital locks put in, um, little cameras, things like that, because I do all of my tours virtually, I make it so that I like unlock the door, somebody walks in, the cameras are watching them, I see them go through the unit, I lock up whenever they leave. So I do, that's how I do my virtual walkthroughs and um, the person's on the phone with me on uh, FaceTime, um, I'm kind of instructing them about things. Um, sometimes I literally forget the, the actual flow through the home, like where each room is. I sometimes forget like, is that, is that second bedroom like in the back or is it in the front? I have to like look back at photos real quick, um, just because I physically have never been there. Um, and you really, I just, I, I don't think that you have to have physically been there if you have a network that you trust. And if you're, if you're asking the right question during inspection, if you're paying attention to the details, um, if like me, you're going for properties that you think are um, reliably built and not going to have issues and you're, you're trying to vet that. Um, and then if you have help on the ground that you take care of, that's a big thing for me is um, it, it's not just about finding the people that you want to do work for you 
and then paying them. It's for me, it's been opportunities to um, create a strong relationship. And so like an example of that, um, if I can give one would be in my leases in Savannah, there is a clause that if it, the renters want anything done, like they want paint done, um, they're all required to do their own lawn care. Um, if, you know, really anything they need done around the property, they have to go to my maintenance man first. He gets, he gets the right to give them an offer first before anybody else. And for, for him, that's a steady flow of business for like random you know, projects. Similarly, I hire his wife to do anything related to cleaning because she does home cleaning. She does it uh, full time for like Airbnbs and things. And I said, you know, every, every time we need an in-depth cleaning between tenants, I will always go to your wife. And so these are like the I scratch your back type of things that build relationships. And so when I need a set of keys dropped off somewhere or someone to just drive by and confirm, hey, like did that tenant like mow their yard? Do you mind just driving two minutes out of the way and saying yes or no? Like these are little things that he never minds. He's like, yeah, absolutely. I've got you. So building those relationships also matters. And I don't know that you could really do fully remote if you don't have some people that you trust in the locations. You said you got your start a couple of years ago, right? Uh, 20, you said 2020 or 2021? What was that now? Uh, yeah, 2021. Okay. So if you were to like kind of rewind the clock, go back to 2021 when you're picking up your first property, um, what are a couple things that you wish you would have known at that time that you now uh, know? Man, um, I will tell you one thing that I would pay good money to rewind the clock on. Um, I wish I would have made my first investment uh, a quadplex. Um, you know, you can invest in your first in, in a primary property up to four units. Um, and you can put so little down on that that it makes investing and having multiple units right away that cash flow, it makes it so approachable to so many people. You know, you're putting a very low percentage down on that home and immediately getting cash flow out of those units. Some people uh, that I've met have like lived in one unit and rented the other ones out and used it to, to cover the cost. But just me personally, that's, that's what I would have done. I would have gotten um, as many units in a property as I could have up, up to four uh, for that uh, first property. Um, I probably... Another one that I might have considered um, is maybe buying um, a two, three, or four plex that needed a little bit of work. I'm not big into like full flips or anything, um, but I have done some like basic improvements like cabinets, flooring, things that don't, things that you can live in while you're doing it and forced appreciation a little bit that way uh, just for a first project. Just because I think that in a very short amount of time, you can take kind of like mediocre quadplex, do a little bit of work and you have some like strong margin, four strong margin units, which then sets you up so much better to be building up cash and then invest later in more homes. It just, to me, it can really speed up somebody's journey to having multiple properties. So that's the thing that I would do totally different. Yeah. I, I love the, uh, the house hacking, uh, example. Um, that's actually, so my, my first property was a three unit property. I didn't live in it. It was, uh, it was, it was actually in Hickory, North Carolina, where I'm from. Um, and I was in DC at the time, but my second property was also a three unit property and I moved into one of the units, rented out the other two. And that was phenomenal. My, uh, yeah. my now wife actually moved in with me, uh, at the time she was my girlfriend and then very quickly fiance. Uh, and I charged her rent too, which she still gives me crap about today. But dude, I was living for free, man. It was awesome. <laughs> it was like the best decision that I had made. And it actually, you know, it, and I know I'm joking a little bit, but it, it was great because it it eliminated the biggest expense that I had. And at the time I was launching my CPA firm. And so I was just looking for ways to de-risk the, the financial aspect of, you know, starting a business. And this was one of those ways to do it. And now I give that advice to anybody that like my sisters are picking up property right now, their first properties. Uh, they're five years younger than I am. And so now I'm telling them the same sort of thing. I'm like, okay, you want to buy something that's multiple units so you can live in one, rent the others out, live for free. It's an awesome, awesome strategy. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and on that note too, about like rewinding the clock, one thing that I've gone back and forth about when I think about doing things over again is I've debated would I have pulled the trigger on a property sooner before doing all that research. So one thing that I would say there is like evaluate what you think is your own level of strength in doing research and making decisions. Because for me personally, I actually think that that's what's led to positive outcomes for most of these homes was taking the time to really learn. But I have met other people who think and act very differently than I do and just pulled the trigger and just said like, you know, screw it. Like I'm just going to go for it. And they learned along the way and they figured it out. And so if, if that's your approach to life and you see good outcomes from that, I mean, maybe 
maybe spending a year researching like I did is not necessarily it. And I can tell you if I had started a year earlier, knowing where rates are now, I would have more homes. So I go back and forth between the two, but I would say like evaluate how you make decisions and how you get better outcomes. Is it being more research driven or is it just like learning from experience and then kind of go that direction? Um, that's something else. It's actually kind of interesting because I think the, uh, the thought in the real estate community is just learn by doing, you know, like, like analysis paralysis gets a really bad rap. So, so you took that more analytical research backed approach. You spent your time digging into the details. Um, if somebody's listening to this and they're thinking, yeah, uh, you know, like ideally we're, we're targeting tech workers with this who are more analytical as it is. So if they're listening to this and saying, yeah, I want to spend my time. I want to spend a lot of time doing research and really understanding the market. How, how do you know that you've actually crossed that line into analysis paralysis? Like when is the research just too much or even like almost an excuse to not pull the trigger? Does that make sense? I remember uh, along the way, like as I was learning, there was this uh, pro forma forecasting sheet that basically was it was going to help me make decisions. Like it was going to be what I used ultimately to make a call on a property. And so um, during that whole learning journey, one thing I did is my friend who was buying all the properties, I started inputting the information from the properties he was buying into the pro forma and then asking a few months later, how's that one doing? <laughs> like, is it doing what you thought? Like, are you getting what you wanted? Like, et cetera. And that was literally just me testing my knowledge. So that's, that's one way to do it. Then there's other hacky tricks. Like I mentioned, like listing fake properties and just seeing if people will apply to them. You can, like basically you can create a foundation to say whether or not you're likely to be right. Like you can, you can do that in various ways for me personally. Like I have to look at that situation where I'm doing analysis and then jumping into something on a very regular basis through my job. So I had very high confidence that I could create better outcomes with data. If, if that's not a strong suit of yours, I would say then that like, just, just do it approach may be better. Um, so I, like I said before, I was, I was really looking at like, do I see that data makes for better outcomes for me? Yes, I do. Can I point to multiple examples of that throughout my career and life? Yes, I can. And then for me, that's what made me take that approach. Yeah. So play to your strengths. I like it. Exactly. Yeah. So Zane, we have three closing questions to wrap this up. Um, so far, this has been great. Um, our first question for you is what is your favorite book? And it does not have to be real estate related. Great. Um, okay. Um, so I'm not gonna answer with a business or a self-help book because I like I eat those up, but people have heard enough advice on that. Um, so my favorite author is, uh, his name is Neil Gaiman. He's uh, like sci-fi fantasy. A lot of his stuff has been turned into like TV and movies. I'm obsessed with everything he does, but I think his masterpiece is this collection of books called Sandman. Um, and I've, I've always felt that way, um, but recently like even Netflix made a TV show out of it. It's been made into um, audible audio books by Amazon with some pretty great actors, but just the story in general, he creates like, I think the most intricate worlds and does it so well. Um, so I would say check out Sandman, Neil Gaiman. Great. I, I really love Neverwhere. Uh, oh, if you've yeah. read that one, yeah. I just think it's a great story. I actually, um, this is a random aside, but I actually went to this like random community production, uh, play version of Neverwhere in somewhere in, in Hollywood. And he actually showed up to watch it, which was pretty cool. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I guess that's which it's one of the benefits of what, what I get for paying absorbent real estate costs. Um, <laughs> second question, um, cash flow versus appreciation. What do you think is more important? Well, um, here's a product answer for you. Um, it depends. Um, and so, uh, for me personally, uh, I'm looking more at cash flow, and there's a couple of reasons why. Um, so I mentioned earlier that I've got many different investment vehicles and they have all varying types of risk. Um, you know, I'm a startup co-founder and up until this year that was not producing revenue. So I looked at that as like the most risky thing I did. Then I've got things like uh, a corporate career and consulting, um, also things like simple index funds and 401k. I put them all kind of into this middle category of like kind of reliable, um, but you know, not, not the most conservative either at times. Um, and then when I look at real estate, the approach that I've taken, um, um, very, very reliable. Like I, that, you know, you think about that single family strategy that I was talking about, the fact that I'm not necessarily going for the riskiest and the highest margins, you know, I, I'm looking to put that in the super conservative category because I'm trying to balance out my life. So I look at stability um, and 
positive cash flow means that you can get a consistent income stream and that uh, it's a good conservative investment in that way. Um, it also allows you to cover expenses and you know generate profit over time. So I think that's a positive. Um, I mentioned the risk management, but if you another kind of angle to risk management is like cash flow helps you mitigate risks uh, with like vacancies, repairs, unexpected costs. So if you maximize that, you've got cash on hand and you can deal with those things as they come. Um, and then last, if you're really looking to stack a lot of homes and you have strong cash flow, I found out through all my research that eventually when I stack more, having a lot of positive cash flow is going to allow me to have more financing options down the road. Um, and so I haven't really hit that yet, but I know that that's going to come into play, you know, after eight properties. And when I really want to start stacking aggressively, um, I'm going to want to have really strong cash flow. So that those are kind of like my reasons around why I optimize there. I know other people are all about appreciation. Um, for me, it makes me too nervous. It's not my game. Got it. Uh, cool. Well, really in-depth answer. Really appreciate that. I do have a follow-up question on that one. Um, if you're optimizing for cash flow, how do you think about the amount of leverage you put on your property and how that affects the cash that you can take out of the business? I personally don't take cash out of the business. Like for like, I, I don't, I literally let it sit there and it's all meant for like future investment. Um, so maybe I'm unique in that way. I I've talked to other friends who do this and they do use it to cover like living costs on a regular basis. Um, I don't have a strong answer for that one. Um, so yeah, I'm, a, I'm pretty conservative on like what I do with, as far as taking cash out of the business. Um, yeah. Got it. I guess, um, to, to rephrase the question, how do you think about how much leverage do you put putting on your investment properties and what that means for just the overall cash flow profile, right? So how much are you putting into the mortgage versus putting more upfront equity in order to have, you know, less of a mortgage payment? Um, I mean, I pretty much stick with like what my minimum down payment is going to have to be. That's just like rule of thumb so far. Um, I haven't learned anything alternative. I'm definitely not putting more than 20% down on a property because I'm looking to get more as soon as possible. Um, and because to me, I'm going after properties that will reliably produce cash flow. So the more I get, the sooner I get them. That's what I'm optimizing for. Um, yeah, I haven't gone past 20% for any reason or tried to like lower the mortgage. Um, but again, but I'm also like buying in areas where based on where I'm buying and who I'm kind of marketing to, I know I'll get a margin um, and I'm testing that ahead of time. So I think maybe if I was determined to like buy in an area where those margins weren't guaranteed um, or weren't, I didn't have like high, you know, confidence that I could get them, I might consider trying to push the mortgage down. Um, I just haven't been faced with that. Got it. Awesome. Thanks, Zane. Final closing question. Any last piece of advice that you'd like to share with the audience that we haven't gotten a chance to cover? Um, really just, I was very intimidated prior to jumping into real estate investment about the, um, how much weight it would put on my life in terms of like being able to manage the properties and like, would it impact like my job or the fact that I do other stuff on the side? Like, could I manage it? Um, and I would just say that it's, it's not as bad as you think if you optimize for that. So if that's one of the things that's driving you not jumping into it, you don't want one more task, you don't want one more thing to do you can optimize your way to that solution, whether it's through, you know, going uh, with property management and going for properties where you can still get a margin that way, um, you know, or taking a hit on margin or just managing them yourselves, but optimizing for properties that make that simple. Um, because that was a real driver of me um, in addition to just wanting to do research that kept me from like pulling the trigger sooner. Um, and like knowing what I know now, it's, it's, it's totally reasonable to manage many properties. I think that, I think that my friend I mentioned earlier was managing like 16 before he got any help, 16. Um, and he went, he went a very similar route with the reliable single, single family homes. So you can definitely, you can create a clockwork system if you put the effort into it. Um, and it's just about, you know, putting the upfront effort, um, you know, optimizing where you can automating, um, but it's totally doable. So don't be, don't be scared of that. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Zane. I think this has been a fantastic podcast and I, we really appreciate you, you know, sharing all the insights, all the learnings and really going deep into how you run your business and how you built your business. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely.